get started and get right into this and calculations in this morning's class. Here's the system we're dealing with. We're dealing with a system where we're trying to find if there's a significant difference. We've got some samples that we're taking from water and we're calculating the biological oxygen demand. So those who know the byproduct BOT is a way to characterize that water quality. And we've got two methods that we can do this with. The dilution method and the manometric method. And what we're saying is we want to compare these two methods. Does my one analytical technique, the dilution method on the left, differ from the manometric method, the method on the right? So we take a couple of samples. In this case, we've got 11 samples from the dilution method, 11 from the manometric method. I'd like you to prove to yourself very quickly, this is a calculation we can do about five minutes or less, that shows that there's no significant difference between the method and the method. This is important. One method is extremely cheap, one method is more expensive. Can I use the cheaper method and still get the same analytical answer? So these examples you see on the board are the values that we use to be the method. We do not need the raw data. However, we're going to look at that in a minute. The summary data down below here is the far more interesting variables, and that's all you really need to do the calculation. Do to yourself. I'll give you about four minutes or so. Go to the person next to you and discuss your strategy for how you'd like to prove that there is no difference between the two methods. And if you can get to the numerical answer to prove that, even better. At the very least, so show how you would set up your problem and, and, uh, and how you would deal with it. Calculation. 
Yes, definitely. If you cannot tell visually, conclusively, that there's, that there's a difference or no difference, absolutely work with the calculation. I can prove it to you. Okay, so the calculated value will always agree with the visual impression. In this case, there's a little bit of a too much overlap between these two groups. In fact, that's desirable in this particular instance because we want to assess whether the two methods have any difference. Okay, so any difference here? Yeah. We would like to use the cheaper of the two. So we would like both methods to give the same answer. Anything that's given in your presentation samples will take it independently of each other in the dilution sample set and the manometric sample set. Do we have a population standard deviation? So we're going to use the T-test. We're going to use the T-test to tell the difference. That invokes or implies another assumption. What's that? That they're normally distributed. What? Schwartz says normally distributed. What particularly is normally distributed? Here it needs to be normally distributed. All the data, some of the data, the population that they come from needs to be normally distributed. So we need to verify that each of the samples in the manufacturer group are normally distributed. We need to also verify that each of the, the 11 data points in the dilution group are normally distributed. So, several assumptions. Independence, very strong. We can only guarantee that by good experimental method. Secondly, we need to assume normality of the population of the data come from. Easy to check. Cubic plot for the data on the dilution, separate cubic plot for the data on the dilution. Then we will introduce our calculations. Okay, so go ahead on that, those calculations are next. And uh, you should take a few minutes there to prove to yourself whether there's a difference between the two analytical methods or not. Prerequisites to verify these assumptions. 
So then we go ahead, we say, well, I don't have a population of standard deviation, so I'm going to estimate that by calculating the sample standard deviation. And I've got those two separately. What I do next then is calculate the pool variance. So SP squared pool variance is 10, or in other words, n minus 1 times 5.9 squared plus 10 again, the number of samples from times its population times its sample of its standard deviation of variance divided through by Na plus Na minus 2 minus 20. Calculate then that the sample standard deviation is 57, or in other words, so sample variance is 62, or the full standard deviation is 7.91. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the z value is to verify the difference between the manometric and the dilution method. So that's the z value x bar m minus x bar d. And we want to reference that against the population difference. So u m minus u d. Divide through by sp squared, the population standard variance. 1 over 11 plus 1 over 11. So we use that pool pool variance. And Z is from the T distribution with degrees of freedom equal to NA plus NB minus 2. So 20 degrees of freedom. Yeah. So degrees of freedom then is equal to Na minus 1 plus N, uh, sorry, N, let's use that notation M and N, uh, M and E. So Nm plus N over E. So you lose the degree of freedom from each of each. That's the value is t distributed with that being the of freedom. Assuming there is no difference, my baseline assumption is there is no difference, I set that population difference equal to zero. And I can calculate my z value then as summing in the various numbers 22.6 minus 16.4 minus zero divided through our. going into this would be our hypothesis is there is no difference. We're proving to ourselves that either there is, we were correct, or we were not. And that we evaluate that next by looking at that value of z and asking ourselves, well what are the likelihoods of getting a z value of 1.857, assuming there is no difference. So we're saying the z value comes from the t distribution. We know t to be peaking at zero. T distribution. And we've got a value this time of 1.857. What are the chances of seeing a value of 8.57, assuming there is no difference? So what's my, my risk and I'm wrong? You can then use the function in R to do that. So we'll use the function as follows, pt, 1.857, v equals 20 degrees of freedom, or u, 
15 degrees of freedom. That will tell you what that probability of seeing a value of 1.857 or smaller is. So this you look up from your tables if you have and printed out from the exam or in an assignment or an online test you use the PTA ash. And that will return a value to you of and then show you that the probability is 96.1% of getting that value. So one way I interpret that is that there's 96.1% chance of getting that dead value. One way of seeing that is that your risk of an infrared is then the difference from 103.9%. Yeah. For those of you that can't see the back of the head, we just uh, put the numbers up here. So we're almost just kind of narrating very serious kind of aspects. I prefer not to use that. Interpreting these risks of areas, it's, it's an absolute correct way of doing it. We, we worked through um, some of that in one of the previous classes. But far more approachable is to pack that Z value into a low bounded, upper bounded, find the range for mu n minus mu. So find a region that will contain that with a certain amount of probability. So we can then do that following the slides in the class last time. So I'll show you the formula up here. So here's the formula for it. You your lower bound and upper bound. The only difference with this formula is here I've shown the CN, the critical value from the normal distribution, because I've got a population sigma. If you've got a sample value, you have a sigma P squared to move the variance. But that's estimated with the data, which comes from the T distribution. So you have a C T max of C N. So this is uh, the method where you know the variance. If we've estimated the variance, that, that, that value now comes from the T distribution, not the normal distribution. The only change that you make, you can compute the lower bound line. So if we do that, you get a far more, in my opinion, interpretive you find that at minus 0 0.77 is your lower bound and your upper bound is 13.3. The reason why I like to show to compute the Z value and the lower bound and upper bound confidence interval is that it helps you interpret what is a higher risk and what's not a high risk. So here we're seeing a 3.9% risk. There's a 4% chance that you're wrong. By those comfortable odds in your analytical technique, there's a 4% chance that you're saying these two methods are identical, but you're wrong. You're assuming that they are identical, but you've got a 4% chance you're wrong. Translate that over to a confidence interval, a population. This is my 95% population. How do you interpret that interval? Would you still say, seeing that up there, that the two methods are identical? Let's talk pure statistics. From a statistical point of view, those two methods are identical. That makes a lot of sense. The interval spans zero. So statistically, we know that we're, we're seeing from that equation that there is no difference between the manometric and the dilution. From a statistical perspective, that would be an absolutely correct interpretation of that equation because that interval spans zero. But look at how it spans zero. Definitely not symmetrically. 
that integral is very asymmetric about zero. So it's telling me, from a practical engineering point of view, I'm going to say, let's go review the system, firstly, and secondly, let's go look back at my raw data. Okay, because was it my raw data that was there maybe an error? Was there an outline in my raw data? Because I'm not comfortable saying there is no difference where this interval is so heavily weighted to the interpretation that there actually is a difference. Okay. If this interval did not span zero, it other, another way of interpreting that, if this interval does not include zero, is to say I was wrong with this assumption. Okay. I was wrong here if the interval does not include zero. But the fact that it does include zero says that your assumption was correct. But the fact that the interval is so asymmetric is telling you, well, hang on, let's go double check. If these two methods were truly identical to each other, that interval should be spanning zero and be doing so fairly symmetrically. <coughs> So it's the asymmetry of this lower bound and upper bound that's giving you some pause. The risk value as well. 4% risk may just be a little bit too much for you to, to say that, make that statement. So I'm seeing a few confused faces in the class, and that's good, because it means that you're trying to engage with what is going on here, and these interpretations are fundamental. We're going to use this interpretation of confidence intervals for the rest of this course. So we must be confident. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, The only thing is, unfortunately, in my slides here, I don't have, a, I have an equation with the CT value to show you. So I'm saying, here's the equation that I used, except I changed CN for CT, and I changed sigma for SP. <coughs> okay, so here, verify there is no difference between the two methods. However, statistically, there's no difference between the two methods. Practically, there is. Let's take a look at another example that will help you understand that. We're looking here and considering two mixing methods, an axial impeller and a radial impeller. And we're asking, do these methods give different mixing types? If I use one impeller over the other, I would ideally like to pick the impeller that gives me the shortest mixing time, so put less energy into my system. And you can go do statistical tests. And here's two examples of confidence intervals I can find. So these are two different cases. The first case says the difference between the axial method and the radial method is a value that lies between minus 450 minutes and plus 284 minutes. Is there a difference between those two impellers? Statistically? Statistically, no, that interval spans zero. Practically? Practically, yes. Practically, no. Practically, practically there's a judgment call. Practically, there's other, other topics uh, that may come in, for example, the capital cost, the cleaning, cleanability of that particular impeller. Depending on what the criteria are. So if we're only looking at mixing time, so forget capital costs and, and usefulness, operability of the one impeller, only consider mixing times. In that first case, which impeller would you select? You want the one with the shortest mixing times. Axial. Axial. Radial. 
Okay, so a radial antenna would be a better selection. An axial antenna is going to have longer mixing times, so a large value minus a small value. That's more fun. Axle and shoulder. Okay, so this also trips me up. What I do is simply sub in some dummy values and figure out which one. If axial were a better option, shorter mixing times, you'd have a lower number for axial and a larger number for radial. So a small number minus a big number is going to get you a negative value. So your interval here is showing you that it's more heavily weighted to the negative side. So an axial interval would be more suitable. So work through, work through it, you can sub in some values, put in 400 seconds for axial and put in 600 seconds for radial. 400 minus 600 is negative 200, that's close to my lower bound. So a rate and axial has got a shorter mixing time. Statistically, this interval spans zero. It doesn't do so quite symmetrically, but it certainly spans it extremely broadly. You would then be free to choose pretty much either option. And I, particularly, I would still go with the axial option, the 10 that be shorter, for that small sample of data you've taken. But you know what? If an axial parallel costs double or three times the price of the radial impeller, I would probably go with the radial. Because it's showing you you've got, you've got that free between. This is why I like confidence intervals. When they span zero, you've got freedom to then to incorporate other criteria now into your judgment. Let's take a look at the second interval. I do a separate set of tests made on a different system, different viscosities, different media. I now get an interval that the range is between minus 21 minutes and 187 minutes. Which interval do you pick? There you go. Statistically, those methods, both of them tell you that there is no difference between them. We have to bring statistics, and we have to use statistics, but we also have to recognize when to stop and bring it into an engineering judgment framework. And this is why confidence intervals are so nice as engineers to work with. Hypothesis test is black and white. It tells you go, don't go, which is often going to be counter and correct. Let's go back to this manometric example of the dilution method. We got an interval that spans zero, very asymmetrically. We said, if we get that, let's go do two things. We go evaluate the raw data firstly, and secondly, let me really just go check the two methods. To maybe collect more data. If we go look at this raw data, as we pointed out earlier, that sample down here, what is this sample point doing to the x bar 10? Depressing it down. So it's actually bringing those two means closer to each other and giving you an answer that there is no difference between these two methods. Go to the data set. I encourage you to do this at home. Find that data point. It's the three over here. Delete it and re rebuild your confidence interval. Can you do all of these tests Okay, great. Next question. This one asked in an email. Can you use median and mad to do some of these? Gut feel. Can I replace the mean with the median? Can I replace the standard deviation with the mad? <laughs> Absolutely. I say go for it. Because when you're doing these tests, especially if you automate this and you write software to do this on data that's automatically collected and never seen by a human being, you can quickly, quickly see this outline down here and will verify visually, as Raymond said, that there's little data around this area. A computer is not sensitive to those things. So you want to automate these using robust techniques. Absolutely. You can replace with a robust method and it will probably, I've not done the calculation, tell you that it is. What you would do is you would, here practically, I see at this point, let me go evaluate what that three was. Was that really a three? Was there some analytical screw up over there? 
Um, let me maybe run one more experiment and replace this three with a new experiment that I run and rebuild my contract. There, there are some, uh, In most of these cases, we have to assume that the data is normally distributed, so the mean and the median should be pretty much the same, right? If the data really are normally distributed, yes. But very often we say, well, my data are not normally distributed. Your boss still says, I want an answer. <laughs> We've got data that are not independent, we've got data that don't follow the normal distribution. We still have to come up with an answer. Very often what we do is we say, I recognize this, but I'm still going to go ahead <laughs> and do this. We have to, this was a, what a bit of the discussion last class was about, to so say, well, how much does that implication of independence, what does it mean? We saw a bit last class that if you don't have data that are, if you, sorry, if you have data that are not independent, it inflates your variance. In other words, it makes the C denominator bigger. What's that going to do to Z? It's going to decrease you, it's going to push you over here. What happens to your risk of a wrong judgment? It goes up. Okay? Very quickly now you can actually start to judge. Well, I'm making this assumption, this is how it's going to come back in mass later on if I'm wrong. And you train it all. Do I, do I go ahead, do I say to my boss, you know, look, we really do need to collect more data before we make this, assum uh, make this calculation because we could be in error. Okay, so are there other distributions? If you collect data, from any distribution, the central limit theorem applies. And you will see data from an industry are typically F I squared distributed as one of the most frequent distributions you'll see. You'll also see Poisson distribution. Because those apply to situations, F distribution applies to a very heavy tail distribution. So it's, it's bunched up, it's got an extremely long tail on the other side. These are these are situations where, especially if you're packaging products, you want to fill a product with only a thousand grams, but if you overfill, it doesn't matter. So you're going to mostly have a distribution bunched up at a thousand and then a long tail up positive. Plus, our distribution comes from events which are catastrophic failures, so pump failures, equipment failures. We use them to model thunderstorms, and we use them to model um, cyclones and hurricanes. So the frequency of those events. So Infrequent bad phenomena are modeled using those bad distributions. So those, those can be and will be observed. This, this method that I've shown you here relies on seeing your data normal distribution. The reason why I showed you the method earlier where we built the dot plot is because that's distribution agnostic. Any distribution, as long as you've got a large body of data, you can use it. And for engineering cases, we often have large bodies of data. We're just sometimes too lazy to get it out. But if we have it, we can do that. So another way to visualize the data is back to the dilution and anatometric method. Here's, a, here's an interesting way of looking at it. I can plot my data and then just bunch everything up onto my y-axis this side. So the blue points are from the manometric sample. The dilution is from the, uh, the red, green axis are from the dilution method. I can visually get the distribution going again. I can see all these dots up here, but few down there. That's already a warning sign that there's, there's an asymmetry in the data. Okay, so like I said on the course website, if you ever want the R source code to any plot you see in the book, or in my slides, just send me an email and I can email it to you. I've got all the R files available. And there's hundreds, so I can't just post them on the website. So if you can email me which one you want, I can certainly give that to you. Okay, so that's the discussion then on confidence intervals and comparison between two groups. I'd like to just talk a bit about pair testing because this is, leads into the design experiments part we'll start to see next month. Pair testing happens quite frequently. So what we try to do in regular testing preferences is we try to um, we try to keep everything constant except the variable we're measuring. So if I'm testing A versus B. I have to keep everything constant except the AB variable that I'm, that I'm adjusting. So 
Here's some examples. If you're looking at a store and you're trying to maximize sales in a store, this happens. Companies evaluate soft and dim lighting versus bright and fluorescent lighting. And they can easily do an AD test to see which one drives sales. Raw materials, A versus B. And we had a bit of discussion on randomization. It's tough to okay. the, We recognize in many cases that keeping things constant is impractical. We're not able to do that. For example, if I do a drug trial, I'm trying a new uh, blood pressure drug, actual drug versus placebo drug. I can't keep everything constant. While I'm on the maybe the placebo or I'm actually on the active drug, my body is changing naturally day to day. My body itself is trying to regulate my cholesterol. Or if, I, if it's a drug trial for a disease, your body is actively fighting that disease anyway during the time. So trying to enforce that everything is constant is, is pretty much impossible. So this is where pair tests come in. They really help to cancel out some of that other factors that are changing. So you'll sometimes see this as two treatments or an experiment run twice on the same, same project. You see this a lot in drug trials, like I just mentioned. You'll randomly give a person a placebo, and then you'll change them over to the active, or vice versa. You're testing an additive. This is an actual example I worked with. Uh, a company was trying an additive that they were adding to a lubricant. The additive was there to give it some specific properties, but they've got a base lubricant that they add, add the additive to. So they take that lubricant, they split it in half, they apply A to one, B to the other. But then they get another batch of lubricants. That second batch of lubricants is very different to the initial batch. So now you put this confounding. If A and B show a difference, was it due to the lubricants? Or was it due to A and B itself? If I'm doing a drug trial, did the drug work on me because genetically my genetics are responsive to that drug or genetically I'm not responsive to that drug? Many drug trials fail because they do not take into account their genetics. So the next step of drug trials that are starting to happen is that you get a genetic screen prior to enlisting in this drug trial and then they target the drug for your genetic makeup. Many drugs are very gene specific. So modern medicine in the future Part of you getting your, your drug would be a genetic screen prior so that the doctor can recommend a treatment that's more appropriate to your ethnic background or whatever the genetic trait is that's, that's relevant to that disease. So here's the definition. A pair test then is a, is a test that occurs when there's something in common within the pairs of samples in group A and B. But the commonality is not between the pair. So you have, let's take a look at the specific case to get that definition right. I want to test A versus B, so I get lower energy usage. I've got materials, but this material amount is only enough to do one test for A and one test for B. There isn't enough material left over to go repeat the A and B, repeat A and B several times, like we've seen in the past examples. But I do have five batches of material, so I can potentially do ten experiments. What we'll do then is we'll split this batch of material one in half and apply A to one half and B to the other. We'll repeat it for two, three, four, and five. So I'll get five samples of A, five samples of B, each one applied to each material. So let's go back to the definition. The paired test is appropriate when there's something in common within the pairs. So here the fact is what's common within each pair is the material. But the commonality is not between the pairs. So A and B for material one, there's nothing in common with A and B for material two. Okay, three, four, and five. So within each pair of A and B, I've got the material in common, but between the A and B sample for material one, there's nothing in common with the A and B sample for material two, nothing in common with A and B for material three, and so forth. So that's a paired experiment. That's how you recognize a pair. So up on the board here are some examples of how not to do it. One way of running those 10 experiments is not to simply go apply AA to the first batch of materials, AA to the second batch of materials, 
split the third batch between A and B and then 4, 4, 5, 5. You'd be confounding your materials with the A and B allocation. Randomly is also not appropriate. What is appropriate is to cancel out that effect of the base material because if the base material impacts A and it impacts B, when I subtract the difference, that's going to cancel out. So if that material does have an impact on my product, the fact that I've tried it with A and B, it's going to cancel out. So what I'll end up doing is I'm actually going to get five pairs. I run 10 experiments, but I'm going to get five pairs. So before I come to that bunch of this bunch, let me actually just go ahead and show the approach. So we're going to say, we're still going to do my test. I still want to judge if A is different to B, or is there no difference? So that's still the same question as before. But here my approach is, is slightly different. Step one is simply to calculate the differences between the two treatments. So in that example of the five materials, 10 experiments, I'm going to have W1 represents the difference in my response between the A and the B on the first material. So W1 is the AB difference on material 1. W2 is the AB difference on material 2. And I'll have five W values. So I have fewer degrees of freedom. Even though I've done 10 experiments, we're used to seeing that you have, have a large number of degrees of freedom there. 10 minus 1 minus 1. We're, we're used to seeing 8 degrees of freedom for that situation. The fact that I'm now going to calculate a new variable and I'm going to do my test on that difference means I've reduced degrees of freedom. So I've got only 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I've only got 5 data points now. It's safe in many cases to assume that those are independent differences. So these difference values now are independent of each other. There's no relationship between W1 and W2 and W2 and 3 and 4 and the others. So that's, if you're doing your experimental procedure correctly, that's a good assumption and, and a fair assumption in many instances. Let's calculate the mean W and the standard deviation of those Ws. What would the mean W be approximately if there really is no difference between the two methods? Okay, zero. Absolutely. So those Ws should be sometimes positive, sometimes negative, if there really is no difference between method A and method A. We're going to get a vector of values above and below zero, but on the mean of them is going to be approximately zero. And I'm going to get whatever standard deviation I get. So that's the standard deviation of the Ws. This W average, let's calculate the mean, I'm going to call it W bar. So this W bar is the mean of this vector up here. W bar is itself a, a variable. It's a random variable. If I repeat the experiments again, I'm going to get a different W bar. And if I repeat it a third time, I'm going to get another W bar still. So W bar is itself a variable, and it's going to be normally distributed from the central limit here. Central limit here says simply take values that are independent of each other and average them. And that's exactly what I've done. Taking n values that are independent of each other and calculating the average, that average is going to be normally distributed. What's the distribution for that? It's going to have a distribution of mu w, whatever the population difference is, divided through by the population variance, which is the original sum of uh, population variance divided by the and so then now I just go ahead and calculate the confidence interval for that Z value. So really no difference to what we've seen before. The only thing is my input data into that statistical test is a vector of differences. In the past, my input data has been the raw values themselves. This time, my input is the differences. So there's the Z value. The z value is w bar, the average w I've calculated, minus the population w divided through by the variance, uh, by the standard deviation. Which standard deviation do I use? We'll never know the population standard deviation. That's, we're clear on that by now in this course. 
knowing the population mean and knowing the population standard deviation is never going to happen. In fact, you can ask yourself, why would you know the population mean and not this population standard deviation? Knowing the mean is easy. Knowing the standard deviation is hard. So never, never should we assume we know the standard deviation. We use the sample standard deviation. So SW. That implies then that Z now is T distributed. So I can unpack this Z value between lower bounds and upper bounds and use the critical value for the T distribution, not the normal distribution. And the t-distribution requires one parameter, it requires the degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So the n here in this test is the number of differences. n is not your number of experiments you've done. n is your number of differences and that's going to be, usually it uh, will be, the number of experiments you've done divided by 2. So very key, people often trip up on this, they've sub in n here, equal to the total number of experiments. That's not the case. N is the values that correspond to the number of differences you've got. That's what's going into our statistical test. So here's, here's one thing I'd like you to think of, and you can try this as well. Let's go back to those BOD samples I have. So here's my, my 10, uh, 11 experiments I did. Let's assume, when I showed you this original data, I said we took, we took one body of water and I measured 11 samples and 11 samples. Let's assume we did this in a paired test. Let's assume I took a sample of water and I split it in half. And a half of it I did using the dilution method, and the other half I did as the measurement method. Then I go back to the river, or the dam, or the lake, wherever I'm getting this water from, and take a second sample. And I split it in half again and calculate the VOD using this method. So now I've got 11 samples that I've taken, each of those 11 samples split in half and done half with the dilution of So I can go calculate a vector of 11 differences between my raw data points. And those form my W vector. I can go compute the average of those Ws standard deviation of those w's and now n. What I'd like you to do is to, to go home and do this calculation, verify it, and talk to yourself whether there's a statistical difference there or not. Okay, so let's be clear here. What's the, what's the commonality between my within my phase? In that case. The highest part of pair differences is often identifying the commonality. The source of the water. The source of the water that you're sampling from. Is there any relationship between each of the pairs? So pair one, I've got my two samples, then I've got my second sample of water. Is there any relationship between the first set of pairs and the second set of pairs? No, they should be independent, so we meet that criteria yeah, of independence. I've got 11 of those differences. Just simply go and apply the regular T test for checking the lower bound and upper bound. There's the raw data. There's your, there's your 11 pairs of differences. What do you, visually from that, is there a difference between those two methods? Statistically, if you calculate it, you'll find that that interval for W spans zero. A new W, you find that it spans zero. Again, because that outlier out there is pulling you to come to the wrong conclusion. It's going to get an interval that spans zero. The interval looks like some, some bounds on this other like that. Go delete that point over there, and your interval will not span zero. Okay, so you've got two pieces of homework to go do. Why don't you go back to the original regular differences between variables and re redo this calculation for yourself, omitting this outline. The second piece to go do for yourself, uh, and I won't be taking this up in class this time, but if you are only is to then go do the pair differences between these. So I'll post those confidence intervals on the website in a day or two.